author and international speaker, Jay Siegert holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology. As founder of the Starting Point Project, Jay passionately seeks to help people establish a biblical worldview based on the authority of scripture. For more than 30 years, he has been graciously tackling tough questions regarding the Christian faith, especially in the often intimidating world of science, bringing it down to a level that everyone can understand. We trust you will enjoy this presentation as Jay delivers a fascinating talk entitled, Creation to Christ, the Old Testament in a Nutshell, Part Two. Well, thanks for joining us for this presentation, Creation to Christ, the Old Testament in a Nutshell, Part Two. I'm assuming you've seen Part One. If you haven't, you really wanna go back and check that out because we covered some really key elements that are building up to where we're starting right now in this particular talk, but I will, by way of review, cover the highlights of what we discussed in part one. We had our timeline that went from about creation up to about the year 2000. Part two that we're covering now will be from about 2000 up to Christ. So let's back up a second, take a review of part one from creation up to the year 2000. We'll stretch out our timeline here. The first thing that we talked about was the creation account the six days of creation, that's the very first thing that happens. So we put that on our timeline. The next major thing was roughly 1,700 years later, the worldwide flood, God's judgment because of sin. Adam and Eve had sinned in the beginning, got kicked out of the garden. God said he had a plan. He's going to send his own son to die on a cross. That's what we get out of Genesis 3.15, which is a thread that goes throughout the entire Old Testament. It's the most important theme. But things had gotten so corrupt and so bad after Adam and Eve sinned that roughly 1,700 years later, God says, you know what, I'm going to destroy the entire earth. But he spared Noah and his wife, three sons, and their wives in the flood. The flood is also the element that kicked in the Ice Age. It was the cause of the Ice Age. We discussed that in a little bit of detail. The Ice Age lasted for roughly about 700 years after the flood. Then we have the Tower of Babel. Noah and his family come off the ark. They were commanded to procreate and fill the earth. The rest of the earth was empty, but we know they didn't do that. They ended up staying in one area, building a tower in rebellion against God. So God confused their language, forced them to spread out and fill the earth, which is what God wanted to begin with. So the Tower of Babel, because of the confusion of languages, forces them to spread out all over the earth. And we looked at the diagram. This was a, a secular diagram of how they envisioned people filling the planet, which is actually pretty close to being accurate, coming out generally out of the Middle East, closer to Turkey, and filling the earth. At this point, in a sense, we have random people all over the planet. But remember, God is going to stick to his plan. Genesis 3.15, he's going to send his son to die on a cross. And the entire Old Testament is God working out that plan. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. We go back to our timeline to look at part two from roughly 2000 to the time of Christ. We'll stretch out our timeline here and look at the first major event, which is the call of Abraham. His name was originally Abram. God eventually changes his name to Abraham. But again, you've got all these random people on the earth. God, though, wants to send his son to die on the cross so he ends up choosing a group of people that through them, his son would be born, the Messiah would come. He starts by calling Abraham and through his descendants, the Messiah will be born. This is what we read in scripture, Genesis 12, one through three. And the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. So God chooses Abraham out of all the people on the planet that through his offspring, the Messiah would eventually come. This is a key point in Old Testament history. So here's a map, a modern map of where Abraham was living in Southern Iraq. We're gonna change this to biblical times. We'll see that he was living in the land of Ur. And then he travels to Canaan, which is gonna be the promised land. He stops in Haran briefly, and then he goes from there to Canaan. Now, Canaan is the land of Israel. It's a promised land that God is going to give Abraham's descendants. So that's kind of the path that he took. He had to trust God to leave everything he had and go 
to the land of Canaan, which he did. Now, part of that call of Abraham included giving him offspring, but you probably know the story. And in the second half, we can't really stop each time and describe the stories in detail. We'll hit just the highlights. And here are some of the highlights. The birth of Ishmael and Isaac. Again, Abraham and his wife are kind of elderly, but yet God is promising through their offspring the Messiah is going to come. And they're thinking, wait a minute, we're too old here. So this is what happened in round number one. Abraham ends up being 86 years old when his first son is born. Sarah was 77. The son that was born was Ishmael. Was he the promised son that God told him about? No, he wasn't. So how does that work? Well, in those times, having children, particularly male children, was very, very important. If your wife was not able to have children, it was acceptable to have a child through someone else. In this case, Abraham had a child through his wife's handmaiden, Hagar. This was not approved by God, but it was culturally acceptable. So it was kind of natural for Abraham to think about this. So he has a son, Ishmael, but this was not the son that God promised. Now round two, Abraham was 100 years old when his second son was born, and Sarah, his wife, was 91. The son that was born was named Isaac, and yes, he was the promise that God had given to them. Now, what's interesting about all this is the current conflict that's going on in the Middle East. You could walk up to someone today in Walmart or wherever and say, hey, all this fighting that's going on in the Middle East, how did that get started? They'd probably say, I don't have any idea. They've just been fighting forever. Well, the Bible actually describes how this all began, and this is what Scripture has to say. Galatians 4, 22 through 23, and verses 28 through 30. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondmaid, Ishmael, the other by the free woman, Isaac. But he who was of the bondwoman, Ishmael, was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman, Isaac, was born by promise. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, Isaac. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, Ishmael. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman, Isaac. So what's happening here? Well, Abraham actually disobeyed God by thinking that God needed his help. He ended up having a son, Ishmael, with his wife's handmaiden which was a violation to what God wanted him to do. But the second son was the one of the promise. But because of this, it started the whole conflict. It started back then, and it is going on today, and it will not stop until Christ returns. So this is a very significant event in Old Testament history. So that's Ishmael and Isaac. Now we're going to continue the promise. Isaac was the promised son, so we'll look at Isaac. Isaac has two children. He has twins, Jacob and Esau. Esau was actually physically born first, and then Jacob, in a sense, right on his heel. So we'll take a look at that. Again, you know the story probably that because Esau was born first, he was given what we call the birthright. That's kind of a double inheritance. It's very significant. But Jacob tricked his brother into giving the birthright over to him, and we know kind of how that was passed. We can't stop to look at all those deals details right now, but Jacob and Esau, sons of Isaac, they were twins, and Jacob ends up getting the birthright, and then we will follow his name going forward. God actually changes Jacob's name to Israel. Now, when you think of Israel today, you think of a nation, which it truly is, but also think of it as being a person. It's Jacob. God changed his name to Israel. And then Jacob ends up having 12 sons, and they each become the head of a tribe of Israel. So they are the 12 tribes of Israel. They are the 12 tribes of Jacob. So that's kind of how all that fits in together. It's very interesting. At this point, we are a long ways away from the creation account that we looked at in part one. And a lot of people think that the Old Testament is pretty disconnected. You have things happen and just billions of years ago or whatever, and eventually we get into some of the things that we're more familiar with. 
But this next slide, I think, is very, very fascinating. I think you'll find it very interesting. Here's a chart of the longevity of some of the Old Testament patriarchs. And you're going to see what's interesting is how they overlap and how tight-knit everything is. We're going to start out looking at Adam. Adam was created by God and he lived 930 years. Yes, he really did live that long. Details for another talk sometime. But what we find is that Adam is still alive when Lamech is around. Lamech is Noah's dad. So Noah's dad could be talking to Adam all about the creation account, how it was perfect and how they messed up firsthand by talking to Adam directly. Then we see that Noah is still alive when Abraham's around. So Abraham could have been talking to Noah who went through the flood, whose own dad met Adam. So he could be learning all about the creation account from Noah who went through the flood. Then we know that Shem, one of the boys that was on the ark, is still around when Jacob is here, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he could be talking to one of the sons who was actually on the ark, whose grandfather actually met Adam, tying it in very close together. So we zoom back out and take a look at this again, that we've got Adam living 930 years. He's still around talking to Noah's dad all about God and creation. Then we've got Noah talking to Abraham about going through the flood and telling him what he learned from his dad about creation and Adam. And then we have Shem, who was on the ark, went through the flood, talking to Jacob, saying, yeah, my grandpa met Adam, and this is what we know about the creation account and about God, tying it all very tightly together. So instead of being so disjointed and stories being passed along and distorted over the years, no, it's all very tightly knit, very fascinating. So that's the 12 tribes of Israel. There are two sons that are a little bit more prominent and probably more well-known. That would be Judah and Joseph. Judah is the one that God chose for the Messiah to come through. And Joseph, you're probably familiar with his story. His brothers were very jealous of him, largely because of the favoritism shown to him by his father Jacob. They wanted to kill him, but they thought, ah, it's probably going too far. We can't do that. I know we'll sell him to some slave traders, send him off to Egypt. He's as good as dead. So that's what they do. So he goes away. And we know what happened also, that eventually there was a famine in all the land, and it caused people to go to Egypt. Well, Joseph had found favoritism in God's eyes, and he had risen to second in power over all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. So his brothers come to Egypt looking for food, and Joseph is in charge. Now, they don't recognize him right away, but he says, Hey, guys, it's me, your brother. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. So go ahead bring the family back here. Pharaoh had favoritism over him, said, yeah, bring your family, give them some good land here. So they came and they thrived living in Egypt. Okay, that raises an interesting question. We know that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for about 400 years. How did that happen? Well, this is what happened. After the Pharaoh that showed favoritism to Joseph died, there was a new sheriff in town. It says someone who didn't know Joseph. And he was really concerned about these Hebrew people living in the best land over here and growing in number. And he was afraid of being threatened by them. And this is what you'll learn from Scripture about that. Exodus 1, 8 through 10. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. And so what happened was, the new Pharaoh says, I don't know who these people really are. How did they get there? There's so many of them. If we don't do something about this, they're going to revolt and take us over. We can't let that happen. So he put them into slavery. That's how the Israelites became slaves in Egypt for about 400 years. So that's the story of Joseph and slavery in Egypt and where it fits into our timeline. Next major event here is the raising up of Moses. And this is probably one of the most familiar portions of the Old Testament, the calling of Moses and everything that he did. We're going to look at a few of the highlights of Moses. The first highlight is that he starts out as a basket case, humorously speaking, 
that Pharaoh said, I am worried about these Israelites, the Hebrews. Let's kill off all the male children that are born. So if a child is born, it's a male, kill it. Well, we know that Moses' mother hid him in a basket. We know that he ended up being raised as one of Pharaoh's own son. Pharaoh's daughter found Moses in the basket, said, can I keep him, kind of like a puppy? And she ends up then raising him as a son of Pharaoh. After that, we know that Moses ends up killing an Egyptian because he saw the Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. Those are his people, the Hebrew people. So he kills the Egyptian, and then he ends up fleeing to the wilderness for 40 years. He's out there for 40 years, and God is working in his life. He's tending obstinate sheep in preparation for leading the obstinate Israelites. So he's out in the wilderness, and then God calls him through a burning bush and says, Hey, Moses, I want you to get back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So he confronts Pharaoh, and we know he goes through a series of ten plagues because Pharaoh says, nope, I'm not going to do it. Yes, I will. No, I won't. Keeps changing his mind. A series of ten plagues that God uses to show God's own power here. Eventually, Pharaoh lets them go. They go out. Pharaoh changes his mind. He chases them with his own armies, and they get caught at the Red Sea. God allows Moses to part the Red Sea. The Israelites go across, and then when Pharaoh's army goes in, the seas close up, goes up and kill Pharaoh's entire army there. Then Moses receives and gives the Ten Commandments on the other side of the Red Sea, Mount Sinai, and gives it to the people. And so now they're on the other side in safety, and God is guiding them through his perfect law, the Ten Commandments. After that, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. What's that all about? That's also very, very interesting. But that's the raising up of Moses, and we'll get into that wandering next. We have the entering into the promised land. They're supposed to leave Egypt and go right into the promised land, the land that God had promised Abraham many years prior. What's interesting is it was only an 11-day journey from Egypt to the promised land, the land of milk and honey. A week and a half later, they could have been there. But we know that didn't happen. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Was their GPS broken? No, they had disobeyed God once again. They were supposed to send spies into the land to check it out, 12 spies. Ten came back, said, we can't do this. There are giants in the land. They're going to wipe us out. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, we can do this. God has promised this to us. Because of the disobedience of the people, God says, nope, you're going to wander in the wilderness until everyone 20 years older, 20 years and older dies out. They will not be allowed to go into the promised land, only to the younger generation because, again, of their disobedience. Now, here are the major events that happen in the promised land. Joshua and Caleb take them across the river into the promised land, and this is what goes on. First of all, we have the Battle of Jericho. When they moved in here, it wasn't empty. There were people living there, including the Canaanites and others. And that leads to an interesting question. The topic of all the violence in the Old Testament. Oh, God's so evil back then telling the Israelites to go into lands and just wipe out all the people. What's with that? Here's the backdrop to that. You've got to study everything in context. God is not this evil, vindictive God, and then all of a sudden he turns kind of the cheek in the New Testament. Picture this. The Israelites, the Hebrew people, are in slavery in Egypt. Prior to that, they really weren't a nation. They were just a group of people that God had chosen. While they are in slavery, God is forming them as a nation. When you undergo persecution, you kind of become very close to those who are also going through it at the same time. So during those 400 years, God is really making a nation out of random people. At the same time, God is showing great patience to those who are living in the promised land. They were practicing horrific things like offering their children, their babies, to Ra, the sun god, into the fire. God was patient with them. He was giving them years and years and years to repent and change their ways. They didn't. Eventually, God says, you know what? Time's up. I'm going to judge you. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to use my own people. I'm going to free them from Egypt. I'm going to bring them into your land, and they are going to wipe you out, all of you. Because if they don't wipe out all of you, they will start to intermarry with you and take on your pagan practices. And we know that actually some of that did happen. But that's the whole reason things like this occur. It's just not that God is vindictive and willy-nilly and capricious and just like, ah, oh, just wipe these people out. 
No, he's saying it's time for their judgment. And the instrument I'm going to use is my own people. So that's what we see in the context of the violence in the Old Testament. Second thing we happen is that the children of Israel enter into a period of the judges. God is still ultimately controlling them while they're in the promised land, but he raises up judges to guide them during this promise. And this is what scripture tells us about that period. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That is a recipe for disaster. When everyone's kind of doing their own thing, there's no singular source of authority. That's what we have today. We've thrown out the Bible as our authority, certainly outside the church, but even sometimes within the church, we don't look at God's word the way we should. Everyone does things the way they think is right, and that leads to disaster. Next thing we have is cycles of disobedience while they're living in the land, and this is what it looks like. We have them backsliding, disobeying God, getting away from him, disobeying his commands, which brings God's discipline. Typically, by an outside nation will come in and attack them or oppress them, which then results in bringing their repentance. Oh, we're so sorry, we won't do that again. And then God delivers them, typically with a military leader or a judge. But then they end up backsliding again, which brings discipline and then repentance and then deliverance and round and round. 17 times they went through this. I think seven are detailed in scripture. Now, before we're too judgmental of them for this, I'm glad that my number isn't in the middle because it might be much higher. We all have that tendency to violate God's laws and then say, oh, we're so sorry, we won't do that again. And God is gracious to forgive us even though he knows we're gonna do it again and again and again. Hopefully as we mature, we do it less and less throughout our life. But that was the cycles of disobedience. Then we move from theocracy to monarchy. What does that mean? Well, they were typically ruled by God during that time. However, they were looking at the nations around them, that they all had kings to go out and fight their battles and things for them. So they said, we want a king. And God says, no, trust me, you don't want a king. That wouldn't go well. They said, yes, we do. God says, no, you don't. And God even says, you know what, if you have a king, all of these things are going to be happening. He listed them out and they said, we don't care, we still want a king. So God says, okay, Samuel, who was the last judge, he goes, okay, go ahead and appoint a king. So they moved from theocracy ruled by God to monarchy where they actually had a king. So they have three kings to begin with and we'll take a look at that very briefly. The first king was King Saul. He started out as a very strong military leader, but he went south fairly fast. He ended up ruling over Israel for 40 years. Because of his sins, God took the kingdom from his lineage, did not give it to his son, but chose David as king of Israel. So he's the second king of Israel. He also started out very strong, had some struggles along the way, his sin with Bathsheba and others. But scripture describes him as being a man after God's own heart, and he was truly repentant. And he reigned for 40 years as well. And then the kingship was passed on his son, Solomon who reigned for 40 years. Solomon started out very strong. He had some struggles of multiplying wives and getting away from God. And so he had a fairly strong reign to begin with, but he had his share of problems, so much so that God says, you know what? I'm going to divide the kingdom because of your sins, but out of respect for your father David, I'm not going to do it during your reign. What's also interesting is that King David, his father, wanted to build the temple during his time, but God says, no, what? you shed too much blood, but I'm gonna allow your son to do it. So we see that it was during Solomon's reign that the temple was actually built. But then something very significant happens at the end of Solomon's reign. We had the United Kingdom of Israel, the 12 tribes all together as one nation, but because of Solomon's sins, God allows the kingdom to be split. 10 tribes go north, Two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, go south. And you can see geographically that's how it all falls out. And here are some of the details of the kingdoms. The northern kingdom, they retained the name Israel, and they lasted for about 250 years. They had 19 kings. They were all bad, and their capital was in Samaria. The southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin, they lasted about 400 years, had 19 kings and one queen. Queen Athaliah was particularly bad, but some of the kings were good, some were bad. 
and their capital was in Jerusalem. So that's the split, the division of the kingdom of Israel, 10 tribes north, 2 tribes south. The next thing we have on our timeline is the fall of these two kingdoms. Initially the fall of the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes of the north. The nation of Assyria came in and they were ruthless. It's kind of like Al-Qaeda today. They didn't come in and take people captive and take them back with them. They kind of came in and wiped out everyone they could. Some of them escaped and they just kind of scattered all over. The rest were killed. It was horrendous. That was the fall of the northern kingdom. Then we have the fall of the southern kingdom. They were taken over by Babylon. Now when Babylon came in, they did attack a lot of people, killed a lot of people, but they typically took a lot of people captive and took them back with them. They exported them back to Babylon, and that's where we're familiar with the story of Daniel. He was deported into Babylon. You have Daniel in the lion's den and all of Daniel's, Daniel's prophecies. That was during the Babylonian captivity that was prophesied about and lasted 70 years. After that, we have the return to Jerusalem. Now the northern kingdom, they had pretty much been wiped out or scattered. But the southern kingdom that was in Babylon, they were let go. Some of them stayed right there and continued some pagan practices. Some of them scattered, but a remnant returned to Jerusalem in three different ways. It's interesting, we've got the chosen people of God, Abraham's offspring that we call the Hebrew people, who became the Israelites because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. But today we also call them Jews. Why was that? because it's basically a remnant that was returning from the tribe of Judah to Jerusalem. So that's one of the reasons why we call them Jews today. But they were the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and the Jews. So three waves, they go back to Jerusalem. Then we have 400 years of silence, or maybe better described, 400 years of anticipation of the coming Messiah. This is a period of time where God is no longer speaking to them prophetically through prophets and giving them information. They've got all the information they need of what's going on in history and the coming Messiah. And there's a fair amount of interesting things that happen during this period. And it was predicted in Daniel chapter 2. First of all, we have a Persian rule. Uh, the southern kingdom was in captivity in Babylon, but then they get released and then Persia takes over Babylon. Then Persians are taken over by the Greeks. And then there's a brief period of independence where the Jews have independence, they're not ruled by anyone. And then eventually the Romans take over and that ushers us into the New Testament area. When Jesus shows up, the Romans are in charge. So that's what's kind of going on during those 400 years of silence or anticipation. So that was the second part of our Old Testament in a nutshell. And again, that thread of the salvation message of Jesus Christ coming is woven throughout that whole time until the arrival of Christ. We are now going to do a quick review pictorially through a book that's out of print now called the Expanded Panorama Bible Study Course. They have kind of an easy way of looking through the whole thing fast forward. You see on the left, Adam and Eve are created, they're perfect. And in the middle, they sin against God, they rebel, they're separated from God. But Genesis 3.15, God has a solution. He's going to send his son to die on a cross to pay for their sins. Then we have Cain killing Abel. And then we have other sons and daughters of Adam and Eve that end up procreating. But the earth got so evil, roughly 1,700 years later, so bad, God says, you know what? I'm just going to wipe them all out. But we know that he spared Noah, his wife, three sons, and their wives. After the flood, they come off the ark. We've got three sons and their wives to be procreating. What's interesting is, genetically speaking, when we do studies of people all over the planet, they seem to fall into three major categories, again, genetically speaking. I think that's probably true because coming off the ark, there were three couples that repopulated the earth. Very interesting tie back into scripture. Now, they were supposed to spread out and fill the earth, but we know they didn't. They built this tower in defiance of God. So God steps in, confuses their language, which forces them to spread out and fill the earth. Then out of all those random people, God's still going to continue his plan of sending a son. God calls Abram, whose name is changed to Abraham, gives him a promised son, which was Isaac. Isaac then has twin sons, Jacob and Esau. God changes Jacob's name to Israel. He has 12 sons, and they become the fathers of the heads of the tribes, of 12 tribes of Israel. 
And we know what happens. They sell their brother off, Joseph, into Egypt as a slave, but he rises second in power. There's a famine, so his brothers come to Egypt looking for food, and Joseph says, hey, it's me. Bring the whole family. The whole family moves to Egypt, but then they're eventually enslaved because they're growing too big, and the new Pharaoh is nervous about all of that. Then God raises up Moses to release his chosen people from Egypt, parts the Red Sea, they go across to Sinai, he gets the Ten Commandments, he gives it to the people, but because of their disobedience and just going into the Promised Land and taking it over, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and eventually Joshua and Caleb take them into the Promised Land. They're there ruled by judges, but everyone's doing that which was right in his own mind, a recipe for disaster. They go through the cycles of disobedience. They whine. They say, we want a king like everybody else. God says, fine, here's King Saul. He reigns for 40 years, starts out strong, goes south. Then King David rules for 40 years. Then his son Solomon rules for 40 years. And because of the sins of Solomon, God allows the kingdom, United Kingdom of Israel to be divided. Ten tribes go north under Jeroboam, who was a military leader. Two tribes go south under Rehoboam, that was Solomon's son. The uh, northern tribe lasts for about 250 years, and then they're taken over uh, captive by Assyria, wiped out and kind of spread out all over the earth. The southern kingdom, they last for about 400 years, and then they're taken into captivity by Babylon and exported to Babylon. That's when you have Daniel in the lion's den. Eventually, they're let go. Some of them go back to Jerusalem to reinstate their temple worship, rebuild the wall around Jerusalem and all that. And then that ushers us into the 400 years of silence or anticipation of the Messiah coming, Jesus Christ. So that is the Old Testament in a nutshell. Back to our, our original quiz that we had. We have the timeline and these events. You can pause now if you want to take the quiz. You should probably do better now that you've gone through the overview of the Old Testament history. But here's the solution to our quiz. The numbers go up on the timeline like this, and we've rearranged the events in chrono chronological order on the bottom. So if you want, again, take a snapshot of this, and it'll help you as you uh, look at your quiz to see how well you did. Hopefully you didn't do too bad to begin with. So again, that's creation to Christ, the Old Testament in a nutshell. It's not a bus bunch of disjointed stories going on. It's one continuous story from creation all the way up to Christ, God's plan of redemption, how he had a solution to solve the problem of mankind's rebellion against him, sending Jesus Christ to die on a cross, and almost nothing in the New Testament makes sense without it. So we hope that you were encouraged by this particular message. You might have to watch it a number of times to really get it to sink in. I had to go over this many, many times for me to get a handle on the big picture of the Old Testament. But what's kind of cool is knowing the big picture, next time you're in church, and the pastor starts talking about Nehemiah rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem, you could say, ah, I know where that fits in. They were let out of captivity in Babylon, and a remnant returned to Jerusalem, and Nehemiah helped build the wall to reinstitute their temple practices. The big picture helps you make sense of everything. So we hope that you were encouraged by that and that you'll join us for other presentations in the future. God bless. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and trust it was an encouragement to you. For more information about our ministry and resources, visit us online at thestartingpointproject.com.